On the 22nd of June, 1907, Kaiser Wilhelm II officially signed the building order for Cruiser F, which would end up being the Von der Tann. But, a couple of months before Von der Tann's building order was even signed, the German Navy had already begun discussions for the follow-up battlecruiser, which was going to be Cruiser G. On the 23rd of April, 1907, State Secretary Admiral Alfred von Tirpitz stated that he believed Cruiser G should be an enlarged variation of von der Tann, and, with a budget of 44 million marks as approved by the Reichstag, which was nearly a 10 million mark increase compared to von der Tann, the construction department told him they believed they could design a battlecruiser mounting eight 30.5 centimeter guns instead of eight 28 centimeter guns as seen on von der Tann. The construction department also made a recommendation to Admiral Tirpitz, stating that they believed the 28 centimeter gun was still highly effective and sufficient in expected battle conditions, and as a result of the Royal Navy's numerical superiority, they believed mounting more guns on a ship was more important than mounting larger bore calibers, and as a result they believed that they should focus into extending the size of the ship to mount additional 28 centimeter guns rather than deploying money into the expensive 30.5 centimeter guns. On the 7th of May 1907, the General Navy Department responded to the Construction Department by stating that if the battleships approved for 1908 were going to increase their gun bores to 30.5 centimeter guns, then it was necessary that the Gruss cruiser followed in suit. However, they believe that the arrangement should follow that of the Royal Navy's HMS Dreadnought with five turrets, bringing four turrets on a broadside and three on the extreme forward and after arcs. They also thought that the budget would allow the ship to have a speed of no less than 24.5 knots and an armor scheme identical to that of the Von der Tann. On the 17th of May 1907, a conference was held by top Navy officials where both arguments would be placed forward and the final specifications for the design would be placed forward to the construction department. Ultimately, it was decided that the cruiser should not exceed the displacement of the battleship for 1908, so this would be approximately 22,000 tons. The main armament was finally selected to be 10 28 centimeter guns in 5 CO7 turrets. The propulsion system would utilize steam turbines, giving the ship a minimum speed of 24.5 knots, and the armor scheme should be no less than that when compared to Von der Tann. However, the recommendation by the General Navy Department for a dreadnought-style turret arrangement was considered, and so a rough sketch of the ideal turret arrangement was created during this conference. It envisioned a turret arrangement identical to that of Von der Tann, except it would have a set of super-firing turrets at the rear. This sketch provided a ship that could bring four turrets to bear on a broadside, three turrets to bear on the extreme forward arc, and four turrets to bear on the extreme after arc. Over the next week, the construction department would create a variety of designs. Unfortunately, many of these designs have not survived history, and as a result, we are only aware of two. Design G2I and Design G5. Design G2I had five 28 centimeter turrets in the arrangement as provided by the sketch in the meeting on the 17th of May, except it slightly rearranged the central diagonal turrets so that all five turrets could be brought to bear on a broadside. Design G5 was an investigation into a lighter armament but heavier armor with the design being largely identical to that of Von der Tann with eight 28 centimeter guns, except it would have thicker armor values in virtually every location. On the 28th of May 1907, the designs were presented to the Kaiser, and ultimately he approved G2I. Over the course of the next 10 months, the construction department would on and off visit design G2I, steadily improving it and refining the design so that a ship could actually be constructed from it that was significantly improved when compared to Von der Tom. A couple of the improvements created during this time was increasing the ship's overall freeboard by roughly one meter, which subsequently increased its seaworthiness, 
refining the gunnery arrangement, lengthening the citadel in order to house the additional main battery turret, and it also sought to settle down on a 42,000 shaft horsepower propulsion system. On the 26th of March 1908, another conference was held regarding the improved design of G2I with several top Navy officials, and during this conference, arguments were placed forward that design G5 should be further developed rather than G2I. The arguments placed forward in favor of design G5 largely came from members of the construction department, which was understaffed and overloaded with work, and as far as they were concerned, each year it appeared that the Navy was requesting a new ship design with significant improvements when compared to the preceding ships, and as a result, they were being overloaded, especially since their primary focus was battleships and not cruisers. The basic foundation of their arguments against design G2I was that the superfiring turret had not proven itself within the German Navy, as live firing tests had yet to be conducted, and they also had to divert extra time into developing a ship that could mount a superfiring arrangement, which took time away from their primary battleship projects. They also pointed out that aside from the Royal Navy, no other navy in the world was constructing cruisers of this type, and the Royal Navy seemed to be satisfied with having only eight main battery guns on a relatively light hull. And ultimately, they did not see the point in Germany escalating the armament of this cruiser while the Royal Navy was still satisfied with a lesser armament, though it is worth mentioning that the construction department was purely looking at this from a design aspect and not the tactical aspect of the Royal Navy's superiority, as while the German Navy was building one von der Tann, the Royal Navy was building three Invincibles. Admiral Tirpitz decided to make a final decision, and he made his position clear. The Kaiser approved design G2I, not design G5, and so, Design G5 would not be proceeded with. Admiral Tirpitz would close the conference by making several suggestions as to how he believed the design should be further improved. He believed the main armor belt should be increased from 250mm in thickness to 270mm, the two wing turrets should have an additional splinter shield 30mm thick added to their barbettes, the ammunition outfit for the main guns should be reduced from 90 to 75 shots, and for the secondary guns, from 165 shots to 150 shots. He also decided that the secondary armament should be made up of no less than 12 15cm guns and 12 8.8cm guns. He also went on to suggest a rearrangement of the machinery spaces, going from 5 boiler rooms housing 2 boilers each, to 4 boiler rooms housing three smaller boilers each, which shortened the ship's citadel. The final important suggestion that Tirpitz made was for the rudder arrangement, as this time he wanted two rudders to be on the center line of the ship. Tirpitz's suggestion regarding the rudder arrangement received criticism from the General Navy Department, and they told the Construction Department that no design alterations to the rudders should have been made without the General Navy Department's approval, but the Construction Department reminded the General Navy Department that various rudder options were being investigated during the design process, and these were merely preliminary tests. Ultimately, the Construction Department would finalize live tests regarding different rudder arrangements, and they would support Admiral Tirpitz's two centerline rudders, as they had the most advantages in the Construction Department's opinion. Having finally selected the two centerline rudders, the construction department had to redesign the bow of the ship for better hydrodynamics while turning, and as a result, we end up with the cutaway forefoot of the ship. This would remain a characteristic feature of German battle cruisers throughout their entire development history. Unfortunately, it was also recognized that the altered bow design reduced buoyancy in the forward section of the ship which made hits to that location dangerous in battle conditions. The design was finally completed. The ship would have a displacement of 23,000 tons standard and 25,500 tons full load. Its length would be 186 meters, its beam 29.5 meters, and it would have a normal draft of 8.2 meters. 
The propulsion system would be made up of four Parsons steam turbines manufactured at Blom and Voss, connecting to four triple-bladed 3.74 meter in diameter propellers. The steam engines were powered by 24 small tube boilers of the Schultz Thornycroft type. This system was designed to provide the ship with 52,000 shaft horsepower, giving it a speed of 25.5 knots, though on trials, it achieved 85,000 shaft horsepower, giving it a maximum speed of 28.4 knots. It would have a maximum coal load of 3,100 tons, giving it a range of 4,100 nautical miles at 15 knots. It would have a complement of a little over 1,000 men. The contract for the first ship was placed on the 17th of September, 1908, with the Blom and Voss shipyard, and hull number 200 was laid down on the 7th of December, 1908, launched on the 7th of April, 1910, and commissioned on the 30th of September, 1911, being named Moltke. The contract for the second ship was placed on the 8th of April, 1909, with the Blom and Voss shipyard. Hall number 201 was laid down on the 12th of August, 1909, launched on the 28th of March, 1911, and commissioned on the 2nd of July, 1912, being named Gobin. The expected construction cost of 44 million marks per ship was not reached, and the Navy ended up spending only 42 million marks per ship. Moltke and Gobin would go on to be some of the most significant battlecruisers ever constructed in history due to their completely separate service histories during the First World War. However, those are stories for another day. So, if you have learned something new in this video, why not leave a like and a comment down below, and have a wonderful day.